Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining me. Uh, as Cindy said, my name is Alexis Billings, and with me is Kristen Flores, who is the lab manager. Uh, today, we're going to give you a short uh, overview presentation of what we've been working on with grapevine red blotch virus, uh, mostly in the north coast of California. So we'll start with a brief overview of red blotch virus, so we're all on the same page. Then we'll talk about some vector ecology before we get into our actual experimental transmission work with potential vectors. Then Kristen will tell us about some projects in the vineyards focused on management of potential vectors, and then we'll wrap it all up with some key takeaways. Okay, let's get started. So grapevine red blotch associated virus, or red blotch as it's called, is a plant virus that affects both wild and commercial grapevines. It's a recently recognized viral disease being first described in 2008. Its symptoms manifest as red blotches on leaves, especially in red varieties, appearing often in the fall around harvest time. Now the biggest concern to viticulturists, wine lovers, and wine lovers from around the world is that the virus affects the grape yield as well as the sugar content of the grapes and therefore the resultant wine. Red blotch has been estimated to cost $68,000 per hectare in the north coast of California. However, now that testing has become more common through PCR and qPCR, it appears that the initial infection was actually caused by infected planting material and was actually human propagated. However, tracking the spread has revealed a secondary spread that is patchy and clustered, which is shown here in the grid of a vineyard across three years. So on the left, we have 2014, the cells in red showed symptoms of red blotch and the plus signs indicate a positive result from PCR. In the middle is 2015, where the green cells show newly infected vines that showed symptoms. And then on the right is 2016, and the blue cells show newly infected vines that showed symptoms. So as you can see, the spread is rather patchy and is not a wave. And this suggests that the virus is being spread by an insect vector. So our goal is to find out which insects are vectors and ways to manage these insects. So in order for an insect to be a vector, there are certain aspects about their ecology that must be met, meaning not every insect, insect can be a vector and not all vectors are created equal. The two main components of being a vector are acquisition and inoculation. We'll go into each of these individually so that we understand how an insect is named a vector of a disease. So first is acquisition which may seem pretty self-explanatory. In order for an insect to be a vector of a virus, it needs to be able to actually acquire or obtain that virus. This acquisition of the virus can happen from direct feeding on an infected plant with contact with an infected individual, such as through mating or courtship, or pass from an infected mother to her offspring. Now, another important piece of the acquisition is that the virus somehow enters the insect. It is really not enough for the virus to just be on an insect, but it needs to be either in the mouth parts or travel into the digestive tract of the insect. The acquisition phase is the first step in identifying a potential vector. The next phase is inoculation. This part consists of the retention and passing of the virus. If the insect can acquire the virus, does it then carry that virus, which we call retention, and then can it pass it along? The inoculation phase requires the successful feeding on a host plant in order for the virus to be passed. So this may seem really obvious, but it's a really good way to start identifying potential vectors by knowing which ones actually feed on a host plant and which ones are just hanging out in a host plant. Second, the virus needs to be somewhere in the insect that it can be passed to an uninfected plant. This is where the part of that acquisition stage becomes important. Depending on the feeding style of the insect, the virus needs to be somewhere in the insect that during feeding, it can actually be transferred. For some, just being in the mouth parts is enough, and for others, the virus, the virus will need to be actually in the digestive tract. If an insect cannot acquire the virus, then the inoc inoculation phase is kind of a moot point. But on the other side, just because an insect acquires the virus doesn't mean it can complete the inoculation phase. So for red blotch in particular, in order to be a vector, the insects must first be present in the vineyard and feed on grapevines. Second, the insects must be able to acquire the virus from either infected plant material, from feeding, or from another infected insect. Third, the insects must be able to retain the virus either through development, if it's required in the instar stages, 
or if an adult, then the virus needs to be somewhere that it's retained as it feeds plant to plant. Fourth and finally, the insect's feeding style must be able to transfer the virus to uninfected host plants. Now it's important to note that some insects will do some of these steps better than other steps or better than other insects. For example, you may have a very common insect in the vineyard that feeds exclusively on grapevines, but it rarely acquires the virus, so it will be an inefficient vector, but a vector nonetheless. Or you may have an insect that is less common in the vineyard, but acquires, retains, and transmits the virus really well. This would be an efficient vector, but because of its abundance, it wouldn't necessarily explain the current spread. These are not mutually exclusive either. You can have both of these insects in the vineyard and between the two, they can account for the spread. So when identifying vectors of plant viruses, it's important to remember there may be one big vector of big effect, or a bunch of inefficient vectors of little effect or any combination. So now that we understand how to identify a vector, we can start to apply this to red blotch virus in commercial vineyards. So the first step in identifying which insects are able to acquire the virus. So to start the search for the vector, the Wilson lab at UC Riverside worked with the Dana lab at Berkeley and did a survey of all the common insects in the commercial vineyards and used qPCR to test for red blotch virus. So here is a list of all the insects found in the vineyard in a survey conducted in Napa and Sonoma counties in 2015 and 16. The insects range across 12 families with most falling in the leafhopper family. Each insect has a count of how many were found and how many tested positive, as well as the percentage found positive. This is an overwhelming list with a lot of information. So we're gonna go through it and point out some of the important findings. So first, we have two species of in the Colodonus genus, Colodonus reductus and Colodonus coccoletti. Both of these insects tested very high for acquisition. 67% of coccoletti tested positive and 50% of reductus tested positive for red blotch. This suggests these two insects are very good at acquiring the virus. However, if we look at the counts, we see that there are actually very few found with only six coccoletti and only two reductus being found across two years of surveys. So this is what I mentioned earlier about that first step is to be found in the vineyards, which these two are, but in very low numbers. So it is, if these two are vectors, they would not account for the current spread at the population numbers that we found them at. The next leafhopper we have is three-cornered alfalfa hopper or affectionately called Tika. Here we see that five of the 38 found tested positive for red blotch, giving us a 13% infection rate. Not as high as the Colodonus species, but Chica is more commonly found in the vineyards. Next on the list is Scaphotopia species. 19 were found and nine tested positive for a 47% infection rate. This is a pretty high infection rate and Scaphotopias is moderately common in the vineyards according to this survey. So from this list, there are four leafhopper species that stand out as potential vectors because they're able to acquire the virus. Now it should be noted here that we do not know where they hold the virus. We use the whole insect to test for red blood virus. So it could be in the mouth parts or it could be in the digestive tract. Now, before we move on to the next part, we need to talk about one more insect and that's the Western grape leafhopper. This was by far the most common insect found in the survey with 156 individuals found. However, none tested positive for the virus. So this suggests that it cannot be a vector because it cannot acquire the virus. However, it is very common and it does feed on grapevines, hence its name. So we are going to include it in our list. So we have identified four possible insects that can acquire the virus and one that is just really common in the vineyard. Moving forward, we're going to put a pin in the two Colodonus species just because they're very low abundance. So this puts our culprits moving forward as the Western grape leafhopper, Tika, and Scaphotopius, which we identified as Scaphotopius goneticus. So I'm going to give a little ecology on each of these three insects. First is the Western grape leafhopper. Uh, this is a very descriptive name for this insect as it's very common in commercial vineyards. It's found predominantly in the canopy of the grapevines and it's already a known pest of grapevines. However, in our survey, it did not test positive for red blotch virus. So it definitely is a question, why are we looking at it? 
it's because it's just so common and it's already a pest that we want to make absolutely sure that it is not a vector. Next is Tika, which is found in commercial vineyards, but it actually prefers legumes and is more often found in the ground cover of the vineyard until late in the season when the ground cover dies and then they reluctantly move into the canopy. And this is because they cannot complete their life cycle on grapes. So Tika has gained some notoriety in relation to Red Watch because of a greenhouse study done in 2016. Tika was allowed to feed on infected greenhouse vines and then was placed on uninfected greenhouse vines. These uninfected vines were then tested for red blotch at set intervals. The study identified three out of 15 vines that Tika fed on to test positive for red blotch after five months. So this definitely suggests that Tika can also inoculate grape vines of red blotch, which makes it a very good candidate for a vector. Our final insect of interest is Scaphotopius, or Scaphy as we call it. It's found in commercial vineyards and is found predominantly in the canopy. We actually were able to start a colony of Scaphy here at UC Berkeley and have found it to feed on grapevines and be able to complete its life cycle on grapevines. So coming back to our two phases of vector ecology, we have a pretty good idea which insects in the vineyard com complete the acquisition phase. So our next step is finding out which of the three insects of interest can complete the inoculation phase. To do this, we set up a series of field transmission studies. We chose to do these transmission studies in the field versus in the greenhouse because the field vines have actual real titer levels of the virus and it allows the insects to be in a more natural state than versus in a greenhouse. We did these field transmission studies in the commercial vineyard in Napa Valley. So what we did is we started with 20 insects from one of the three species of interest that we caught from the vineyards. We then caged those insects on a known infected vine in the vineyard for 48 hours to feed. We then removed the vine with the caged insects and brought it back to the greenhouse where we transferred the insects to a clean vine in the greenhouse. Now, although we would have loved to cage the insects on an uninfected field vine, no commercial vineyard would want us to possibly infect more vines. So we had to do the inoculation part in the greenhouse. So the insects were allowed to feed on the clean vine for 48 hours. We then removed the insects and placed the vines in the greenhouse, testing them every four months using qPCR for two years. So if any of our suspect, su suspected culprits are a vector, we would find that the uninfected vines become infected after being fed on. So the Western Grape Leafhopper and the Tika transmission studies were done in the summer and the fall of 2018, and the Scaphotopius transmission studies were done in the fall of 2019. We will go through the results one by one. The vines that the Western Grape Leafhopper fed on, perhaps not surprisingly, have tested negative so far. We're still waiting on the results for that two-year sample. However, since zero came back positive during the acquisition survey, it seems very unlikely that Western Green Leafhopper is a vector. We knew this going in, but we wanted to make absolutely sure, again, because it's such a common insect in the vineyards. All the clean vines that Chica have fed on so far have tested negative as well. But again, we do not have that two-year result back yet. Now, we can't rule Chica out completely since it did test positive in our survey 13% of the time and because previous research has found it to be able to inoculate uninfected vines. However, it should be noted that all the research into Tika has shown it to prefer legumes, which are often in the ground cover, and that it cannot complete its life cycle on grapes alone. So its biology makes it a poor vector of a grapevine virus. Finally, the vines that Scaphotopia sped on have also tested negative so far, but we have only processed that four month sample. It should be noted that we took subsamples of Scaphotopius from the field before we placed it on an infected vine, as well as after. And we found that the Scaphotopius from the field was infected 36% of the time. And after feeding on an infected grapevine for 48 hours, tested positive 44% of the time. So combine this with the previous survey that found 47% to test positive and that we only have results from the four month time point and we cannot rule out Scaphotopias yet. Now, since the jury is still out on Scaphotopias, but it really looks promising, we have been doing some greenhouse experiments that alter the acquisition times. 
So we started a Scapatopius colony at Berkeley and we've been pretty successful in rearing them. So what we did is we took 20 to 30 adults and placed them in a cage with two to three infected vines. We then transferred five to a new cage with a single uninfected vine uh, at five days, 10 days, and 15 days. All were allowed to feed for 72 hours on the uninfected vine. Now these studies are still being undertaken, but we will hold the vines for two years and test them every four months for red blotch virus. Now, the reason we opted for bearing the acquisition time first is because it may be that the virus needs time to travel to a part of the insect where it can be transferred to an uninfected vine. So perhaps the virus is acquired quickly, but it takes a few days for it to travel into the digestive system before it can be transferred during a feeding event. Because remember, when we test them, we use the whole insect so we don't know where in the insect the virus is. We are also gonna do these varied acquisition times with Tika, as well as possibly do some similar experiments with both Scapi and Tika varying the inoculation time. So to wrap up this section, Western grape leafhopper is most likely not a vector of red blotch. Tika, if it is a vector, is most likely an inefficient vector of, of red blotch, but studies varying acquisition and inoculation times may reveal more about Tika. And that Scapatopius may still be a vector of, of red blotch virus, so please stay tuned. Great, thank you Alexis for that thorough review of possible red blotch vectors. So now I'm going to discuss ways that these insects can possibly be controlled in the vineyards to limit the spread of red blotch disease. So our lab specializes in integrated pest management or IPM, which is a holistic ecosystem-based strategy for long-term pest management. This means that we use a variety of methods to control pest populations with an emphasis on reducing the use of pesticides. And this approach is important because it helps conserve the environment and requires fewer inputs over time. So in short, our goal in IPM is to effectively control pests by working with natural processes and limiting harm to the environment and to human health. One method of IPM is cultural control, which is any practice that reduces the ability of a pest to reproduce, disperse, or survive. For our study, we implemented cultural control by maintaining the ground cover between vineyards. Certain pests, especially tika, depend on the ground cover throughout their life cycle, including in mating, laying eggs, dispersal, and overall survival. The idea for this study is that if we alter the ground cover, we will disrupt pest life cycles and prevent them from establishing in vineyards. And I will go over the methods of how we did this shortly. So to reiterate, the potential vectors are Western grape leafhopper, Tika, Scaphotopius, and the two Colodonus species. Western grape leafhopper, Scaphotopius, and Colodonus are all leafhoppers that are most commonly found in the vineyard canopy. Tika, on the other hand, has been primarily recovered in the ground cover and depends on it for its survival. To control the ground cover, we used mo and disc treatments. So on the left, we see an example of the mo treatment. The ground cover has been cut back, but vegetation is still present and could possibly serve as a habitat for tika and other pests. On the right is the disc treatment. Ground cover has been completely removed between the rows. So in comparing these two treatments, we will see how the presence of ground cover affects the ability of tika and other potential pests to migrate into the canopy. So in this study, we monitored five different vineyards in Napa and Sonoma counties. Each site had five mo blocks of five rows each and five disc blocks of five rows each. So this means that each block contained five rows and each block was either disced or mowed. We sampled the third row in every block and there was one buffer row between each block. So ultimately this means that we sampled five mo rows and five disc rows for each vineyard. So to sample the canopy, we placed yellow sticky traps on the top trellis of each sample row. To sample the ground cover, we sweep netted the ground cover in the sample row. And sweep netting means sweeping a large net back and forth on the ground for a certain number of times. Yellow sticky traps were collected every two weeks, which means that they show insects caught during that two week period. 
On the other hand, sweep nets were conducted once every two weeks, which means they show insects collected at a single point in time. Great, so now we will be moving on to the results and we will see how each insect vector candidate was affected by the mow and disc treatments. This section does have a lot of graphs, but we'll hopefully move through them slowly so that it won't be too overwhelming. So first we have the results for Western grape leafhopper in the canopy. The graph on the left shows the average number of Western grape leafhopper caught on yellow sticky traps each month. On the y-axis is number of Western grape leafhoppers, and on the x-axis is month. Disc is shown in dark blue, and mo is shown in light blue. So you can see that the Western grape leafhoppers tend to peak in July and August with the highest average number collected at 60 individuals. Their numbers are fairly low the rest of the year. The graph on the right compares mo and disc treatments in the canopy with average number of Western grape leafhoppers caught on the y-axis and treatment on the x. So we found that Western grape leafhopper numbers were significantly higher in disc rows in the canopy. Although the difference between mo and disc appears to be similar, the large scale does make this significant. These next graphs show Western grape leafhopper recovered and the ground cover. Again, average Western grape leafhopper is on the y-axis, month is on the x-axis, and disc is in dark blue and mo is in light blue. Right away, we notice that these numbers are much lower compared to Western grape leafhopper recovered from the canopy. The peak in the canopy was at 60 individuals, and the peak in the ground cover is just an average of 0.6 individuals. So we hardly found any Western grape leafhoppers in the ground cover. The graph on the right compares the disc and mo in the ground cover. You can see that Western grape leafhopper were found in low numbers, an average of 0.15 were captured, and there was not too much difference between disc and mo. So next we will discuss tika in the canopy. On the graph on the left, we see that the average number of tika recovered on the y-axis per month on the x-axis. Again, disc is in dark blue and mo is in light blue. This graph tells us that tika isn't present in the canopy in the beginning and end of the season, which also correlates to when the ground cover dies off. We can also see that in mo rows, tika is present in the canopy earlier in the season. So the graph on the right compares mo versus disc rows for yellow sticky traps. We can see that significantly more tika were found in mo rows in the canopy than in disc rows. This would indicate that tika stays in areas where there is ground cover present. Next are the results of tika found in the sweep nets. The graph on the left shows the average number of tika recovered on the y-axis and month on the x-axis, again with disc in dark blue and mo in light blue. We can see that tika was only found in mo rows in the ground, with ground cover. Uh, the graph on the right confirms this, showing that tika was only found in mo rows and none were recovered from the disc. So the third insect that we will look at is Scaphotopius. This slide shows Scaphotopius collected in the canopy by yellow sticky traps. The graph on the left again shows the average number of scaphi recovered on the y-axis, month on the x-axis, disc in dark blue, and mo in light blue. So we can see that scaphi numbers were higher overall in 2020. The population experienced peaks in May 2020 and August 2020. We can also see that the number of scaphi recovered was pretty consistent between mo and disc rows. The graph on the right hand side also shows how there's little difference between disc and mo row treatments for scaphi in the canopy. And this means that scaphi was largely unaffected by ground cover treatments, which makes sense because it is not typically found in the ground cover. So next we are looking at scaphi found in the ground cover by sweep netting. The graph on the left shows average scaphi recovered on the y-axis and month on the x-axis disc in dark blue, mo in light blue. We should note that the scale is much smaller with at most an average of 0.02 scaphi being collected. In comparison, scaphi peaked in the canopy with an average of almost 15 individuals being collected. The graph on the right compares disc and mo on scaphi ground cover populations, and it would appear that they are found at much higher numbers in mo. However, the scale is so small that this is actually not a significant difference. 
So now an overview of the results for Collidonis reductus. Both graphs show the average number of Collidonis reductus on the y-axis and month on the x-axis. The graph on the left shows Collidonis reductus found on yellow sticky traps. Their numbers are pretty similar between Mo and disc rows, and they peaked in May 2020. The graph on the right shows Collidonis reductus found in the sweep nets, and it shows that they were rarely recovered or they were found at very low numbers. And finally, our last insect, the Collidonis coccoletti. So this graph shows the average number of Collidonis coccoletti recovered on yellow sticky traps on the y-axis and month on the x-axis. There's no significant difference between disc and mo rows. Data for sweepnet isn't shown because we collected zero Collidonis coccoletti in the ground cover. So this is a lot of data, but there are some key findings. First, Western grape leafhoppers were more often found in the canopy and disc rows. For Tika, disking neg negatively impacted their presence in the canopy. Tika were also not found at all in the ground cover in disc rows. This means that disking may effectively prevent Tika from colonizing the canopy. For Scaffi, on the other hand, disking, disking and mowing had no effect on their populations in the canopy or the ground cover. And this makes sense since Scaffi do not depend on the ground cover for their life cycles, so altering it shouldn't affect them. Similarly, disking and mowing did not affect Collidonis reductus in the canopy or in the ground cover. And finally, Collidonis coccoletti was only found in the canopy but the treatments had no effect on the population. Thank you, Kristen. So to wrap up our understanding of the vectors of red blotch, Western grape leafhopper is most likely not a vector of red blotch and it's also not controlled by disking treatments. Chica may be a vector of red blotch, but if it is, it's probably an inefficient vector but disking the ground cover is an efficient way to control Chica abundance without pesticides. Scaphotopius, Collidonis reductus, and Collidonis coccoletti may be vectors of varying efficiency, but disking is not a reliable method to reducing their populations in the vineyard. Thank you for tuning in to what we know so far. We do have some more work planned for this, including trying to start two Collidonis colonies so that we can do some transmission experiments with them as well as altering acquisition and inoculation times for both Scaffi and Tika to further understand their possible efficiency as potential vectors. And with that, we wanna thank the PIs, Dr. Kent Dana and Dr. Houston Wilson, as well as the co-PIs, Monica Cooper and Dr. Rodrigo Alameda, everyone in the Dana Lab at UC Berkeley, uh, our funding through the USDA, as well as all the wonderful people up in the vineyards of Napa and Sonoma that let us do our work there. Thank you very much for your attention. We are happy to take any questions now, or you are welcome to contact us at a later date if you come up with questions or comments. Thank you, Alexis and Kristen. Very good presentation. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A and Aubrey will be reading those questions to you. Okay. Alrighty, uh, the first question is, have you found red blotch in the weeds where the Tika lives in the spring or the summer? Excellent question. Uh, so we have tested a lot of other plant materials, trying to find out if red blotch can be uh, basically hiding in other plants in the off season. No other plants have tested positive for red blotch besides wild grapes, which sometimes do exist in the riparian area near grapevines, and as well as commercial. All right, great. And then um, it seems like your PI left a comment uh, that says, even though no Western grape leafhoppers were shown to be vectors, there are so many of them, they could accidentally, oh, it's a question. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> um, so even though no Western grape leafhoppers were shown to be vectors, there are so many of them, could they accidentally move the pathogen, noting that the Washington group suggests that the Virginia creeper leafhopper is a vector? Uh, so we haven't had any evidence of that being able to happen. Um, also, if it is Western grape leafhopper, because there are so many, you would see a difference in the spread than what we're seeing most likely. 
Okay, great. Um, seems like that's the, oh, sorry. A couple more questions <laughs> just popped up. Um, does eliminating legumes help prevent Tika? So we haven't done those experiments yet. However, we do know that there is a close relationship between Tika and legumes because they need it, as Kristen said, to complete their life cycle. Um, so potentially reducing legumes in the ground cover may be enough. Uh, however, they may be able to move on to other less desirable uh, ground cover crops that they could still complete their life cycle on, but we haven't done that research yet. Okay. Um, the next question is, do you find that the grapevine canopy populations of insects found in the disc slash mow ground cover management treatments hold true irrespective of surrounding ground cover, um, for example, riparian or adjacent fields? Uh, this person manages a vineyard with very little ground cover, yet find more evidence of Tika feeding in that canopy than any other vineyard that they manage. Kristen, you want to take that? Yeah, sorry, I'm like rereading it. Um, I mean, we did do previous studies seeing if there was an edge effect. So seeing if Tika were more commonly found in riparian areas or areas that were farther away from those zones. And I think we didn't find much of a difference. Um, so I feel like they're mainly found in the ground cover. It should also be noted, we have been trying to find that where they overwinter because they do not overwinter in the vineyards and we have yet to find out where they go. But we have uh, done a lot of surveying of uh, riparian areas near the vineyards and we have yet to find them. So we're not convinced that that's where they go. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, next question is, thrips are known to transmit the tomato spotted wilt virus. Have you done any research on thrips as potential vectors? We have not. Uh, as we said, we did uh, the survey of the most common insects uh, in the vineyard, since the number one thing in order to move grapevine virus, you have to be in the vineyard. So that's where we started. So we haven't really looked at anything that we didn't find directly in the vineyard or that tested, that didn't test positive for the red blotch virus besides the Western grape pepper. Well, thrips are like pretty commonly found in the vineyards. I think the reason that we didn't test them is because red blotch virus is most similar to viruses that are transmitted by leaf hoppers and tree hoppers. And they are not really similar to viruses that are transmitted by thrips, but that could be something that we test in the future. Um, last call for uh, questions. Uh, okay, it seems like one just popped up. Um, this person comments that they believe uh, Dr. Walton at Oregon State has looked at thrips and has potentially ruled them out. So, okay, great. <laughs> less to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is there any other questions? Um, any other attendees want to pose any questions before we wrap up? Okay, so um, with that, thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you um, for, for presenting. Us.